Yeah. I didn't do anything. I wasn't going to try using the malware bytes that I made. Thanks. There. Knock it out. You can't, can't give a thing to presentation without so if you have a virus. You can't uh, have the malware bytes. <laughs> Specifically, how are we going to calculate this epsilon 1 and epsilon 2? Well, we're going to use the Vienna Abinatio Simulation Package, or VAS for short. And what this does is it calculates the imaginary part directly. So this epsilon 2 here. And then internally, what it also does is it uses complex variables um, relationship known as the Kramer Conan relation. And what this does is it calculates epsilon 1 from epsilon 2. So now we have epsilon 1 and epsilon 2. What can we do? We can calculate the rest of the optical coefficients, um, including the complex refractive index, reflectivity, and absorption. So this is just an example run that we did uh, with crystal and silicon, just to show you what we can do. Up in the top left corner, we had the complex primitivity. So the red part is the real, or epsilon 1, and this uh, the blue part is epsilon 2. Now from this, we can derive the other coefficients, like I just said, by uh, the n and kappa here. Um, our reflectivity and the absorption. So now we have, uh, this is where the idea of optical properties really uh, kind of gives you the more, uh, more, more applicatory sense. Um, so now that's the end goal for our project is to come up with uh, graphs like these, but just with our materials. Uh, so now that we have the background, uh, Nate's going to talk about his material of the vanadium oxides. So, so uh, on to the actual projects, like you said. Uh, my materials that I'll be focusing on are the different allotropes of vanadium oxide. And there's a number of reasons that I uh, chose these materials specifically. One being that there is a great amount of experimental interest in them, uh, while still being uh, relatively few theoretical results. So when I was doing my research on the subject, I was finding many different studies that have been conducted experimentally, uh, which is good to show that there is interest in these materials and there's some use for them. Uh, but when it came to the theory, it was lacking. So I actually hope to fill in the gap when it comes to the theoretical part of these materials. Um, and one of the reasons that Trey is in so, so much uh, experimental interest in them is because of their metal insulator transitions, where they actually transform from a metal to an insulator or vice versa. And I'll talk a bit about uh, that specifically in a later slide. Um, finally, there is a high potential for application of these vanadium oxides um, in many different kinds of optoelectronic devices. And I'll give some examples of those in a bit. Um, so there's actually many different allotropes of vanadium oxide, but I'm going to be focusing in on six of these. Uh, these six being VO2, V2O5, V2O3, V3O5, V4O7, and V6O13. And each allotrope, then again, also has uh, two phases of interest, one being metallic and one being uh, insulating. So I'm actually going to be studying 12 phases of the materials in total. And the reason that I chose these six in specifically uh, was because they're the ones that had the most experimental interest in them while still having some theory unexplored. Um, and I actually have some examples of the pictures of the structures of a couple of these allotropes. So here I have vanadium dioxide in the metallic phase and insulating, uh, and also V305. And you can see that depending on the allotrope, the structures between the two phases uh, may differ greatly, such as with vanadium dioxide, um, it changes from tetragonal to monoclinic, so it's a big change. But then with V3O5, uh, it still changes, but it's, it's not as great. It's actually, they're both monoclinic. Uh, there's just a slight change in the lattice parameters. But what we care about is that the electronic and optical properties between those two phases is drastically different. And so to actually talk about the metal insulator transitions themselves, uh, basically what happens is that at a certain temperature called the critical temperature, uh, each allotrope transforms from a metallic phase into an insulating phase, or vice versa. And depending on each allotrope, the temperatures uh, can range. For the ones that I'm going to be focusing on, it'll be between 150 kelvins and 530 kelvins. And I actually have an example over here of an vanadium dioxide, which starts off in the high temperature metallic uh, rutile phase and then transforms into the low temperature monoclinic uh, insulating phase. And it's really this uh, change in the structure 
that causes these uh, change in the electronic and optical properties to take place. And to get an idea of the magnitude of the change in these properties, I actually have this graph here where in the uh, monoclinic phase, it has a resistance of 10 to the 5 ohms, whereas after the transition takes place, it's much lower, somewhere more on the scale of 10 ohms. So you can see it's a pretty drastic difference. What's the x-axis there? Um, this would be the temperature. And so here's a table, just a bit of information about each of these allotropes that I'm going to be studying. Uh, you can see that I have the oxygen to vanadium ratios, with the smallest being 1.5 and the largest being 2.5 and the rest in between. And then I also have the space groups and structure types of each. Um, and you can see, like I said before, some vary in between the phases, such as V205, it goes from orthorhombic to monoclinic, whereas, let's say, with v V407, it stays triclinic, and even the space group stays the same. But with that one, it's actually just a slight increase in volume across that phase transition. Um, and then, like I said before, the critical temperatures do vary for each of these, um, which would allow each allotrope to be used for something greatly different than the other may be used for. And so, uh, actually moving on to some applications now. Uh, currently, vanadium oxides are used um, in some applications. Uh, one of these is actually a microbolometer, which I have an example of over here. And how that works is it uses the sensitivity of the resistance of these vanadium oxides in relationship to temperature to its advantage. Uh, and it uses that to measure the action that's hitting it. So these can be used in things such as uh, infrared cameras. And then uh, some vanadium oxides are also used as cathode materials in lithium ion batteries. And so you can see that some of the current applications are a bit more focused on the electronic properties. Whereas with the potential applications, um, they're a bit more focused on the optical, which is why we're going to be predicting those. Uh, some of the examples of these, uh, they'd be any sort of electronic or optical switching device, and this is due to the metal insider transitions. And some examples would either be um, smart windows or energy conserving coatings, where they would be deposited in, in thin film form, and they actually function to absorb some energy from the light after a certain temperature is reached. And it's also important to note that the critical temperatures of each outro can be altered by doping, uh, which would allow for an even greater versatility when it comes to the applications of these materials. So in addition to the actual applications, there are other benefits. Uh, one being to actually see how well the theory really does with these materials, because when it comes to density functional theory, it's not necessarily a perfect science. Uh, so we want to know how well does it do uh, when comparing to these vanadium oxides. And we can also try and find what method would really work best uh, for them. So if you remember from our last presentation, we talked a bit about the different types of pseudo potentials that we can use in our calculations. Um, and that'd be an example we could see like what would really work best for the vanadium oxides. Um, another benefit would actually be to shed light on the mechanism of the metal insulator transition um, and how it really affects the vanadium oxide because when it comes to these transitions, it's not necessarily 100% known uh, how exactly they work for every material. So by calculating the properties of the materials on either side of the transition, we can help to really sort of elucidate some of the mystery behind the transition itself. And finally, uh, by using density functional theory, we can predict how each material would approximately act in perfect conditions. Uh, and this can be important because when you're trying to understand a newer material, you might want to see how it acts ideally. And experimentally, it can actually be very difficult to synthesize uh, ideal material with no imperfections or vacancies or anything. Whereas with the purely theoretical approach, we can simulate that ideal material and then predict the properties of it. Okay, so here's another table uh, more focused on the structural characteristics of each allotrope. So we have the lattice constants over here and the volume there. And in the red, we have the experimental values of each of these, whereas in the black, uh, we have the values that I've calculated so far. So you can see that I've done two allotropes so far, and the values compare pretty well with experimental. 
And the rest of these I'm currently working on, I have some calculations that are waiting to run, and I hope to finish those soon, so then I can move on to the next steps of the project. And so those next steps are gonna be uh, calculating electronic properties, such as band structure and density of states, uh, finding the band gap of each allotrope, and once that's done, I'll move on to the optical properties. Uh, and like we said earlier, we'll actually use the complex dielectric function to calculate some important properties such as reflectivity or absorption and a few others. Uh, and I might also calculate some physical properties such as bulk modulus or elastic constants. Um, and once I actually have all those results in, I can analyze them and actually see what uh, interesting results I can uh, make out of the project. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, project that I'm working on. Uh, I'm working with double phosphate nitrides, uh, more specifically uh, double phosphate nitrides with uh, noble metals, so copper, gold, or copper, silver, and gold. And I'll get, I'll get into that in a later slide. But first, uh, just some motivations. Um, there exists extensive work with uh, copper and silver oxides in the literature, uh, both in experimental and computational methods. And uh, recently, copper nitrides have become another point of interest, uh, especially in the double phosphate structure. So that's why we're um, pursuing this. Um, some possible applications that uh, in the literature, but there's a possible use for these materials to be uh, in photovoltaics, uh, specifically as transparent conducting nitrides, or um, the solar energy converters themselves. Um, because there doesn't exist a lot of literature on this class of materials, um, this is going to be a predominantly predictive study. So we're going to uh, analyze the results to see if um, the materials are worth looking into experimentally. Um, so with some structural properties, uh, del when I say talk about delophosite, I'm talking about a particular crystal structure. Um, the uh, prototypical delophosite is this copper iron oxide structure. Um, there are two polytypes. Uh, there's a 2H and a 3R polytype, which are both hexagonal, and uh, they're both pictured over here in this figure. Um, the 3R is characterized by this packing uh, A, A, B, B, C, C, whereas the 2H is characterized by the A, A, B, B packing. Um, in my uh, work so far, I've dealt with just the 3R <coughs> so far. Um, we're considering looking into the uh, 2H as well. Um, but again, all I have so far is the 3R. So getting into um, the materials that I'll be working with specifically, um, since we're dealing with the uh, A part being the noble metals, and we already have determined that we're going to be working with uh, the nitrides, this um, leaves us with a few uh, options for this uh, B element. So since the copper, uh, silver, and gold have a valency of 1, and the nitrogens each have a valency of 5, that leaves us with the the uh, the B atom. It would need a valency of five tap uh, for all the atoms to have an average valency of four. Or, uh, yeah. <coughs> so that leaves us with just the options for vanadium, tantalum, and uh, niobium. So it gives us a total of nine possible compounds in this class of materials. So far, um, there has been experimental and computational work published for three of the compounds: so copper tantalum nitride, copper niobium nitride, and silver tantalum nitride. So what I'm going to do is basically fill in the gaps and do the six other ones as well to um, <coughs> see if those give us any interesting results. So uh, a little bit more with the structural properties. This is similar to what Nate showed in his work. Uh, in the black is uh, what I have calculated, and in the red is the ex uh, experimental and uh, computational work from the literature. So for the copper tantalum nitride, uh, copper niobium nitride and silver tantalum nitride, the uh, lattice constants and the volumes match up fairly well. Um, and obviously for the other six compounds, there, we, I haven't found any um, other work in literature, at least yet, uh, to compare with. So, um, let's see. So getting into the uh, optical properties, uh, what I'll be doing, just some background. I'll be focused in on the absorption. So photons with different energies, or wavelengths, are absorbed differently, obviously, when uh, penetrating certain materials. 
Um, and this absorption can be characterized by the absorption coefficient for material alpha. Uh, and it is material dependent. And it is also related to the extinction coefficient kappa, which um, is, again, it's another reason why we need this complex refractive index that they discussed in the uh, beginning of the presentation. Um, alpha is given here. Again, as you can see, it's related to kappa and uh, lambda here. And it does describe how light dissipates as it penetrates farther into the medium. So in this figure over here, we have the spectrum from uh, ultraviolet light all the way to the red and infrared. And this describes um, the penetration depth for uh, the light into water. So water is our medium in this example. As you can see, the blue light is absorbed the least, so it penetrates farthest into the water, whereas the red and infrared uh, doesn't get very far. Now in this particular example, you can see the depth is on the order of 100 to 200 meters. But in our case is what we're going to be working with. Um, for the penetration depths, you're only going to be uh, on the order of uh, microns. So this is just a macroscopic example of what we're going to be doing. So uh, I'm going to be modeling my work on this paper, which um, compares two values, uh, the absorption uh, coefficient and the band gap. Now, specifically with the absorption coefficient, we're going to be looking at the absorption onset. And this is kind of just a zero point. This is more for consistency. As if, you, if you look at this uh, chart over here, this is the absorption uh, graph. The absorption onset seems to be kind of at a zero point. But since the absorption is usually on the order 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, um, we can uh, define this absorption onset to be the energy at which the absorption coefficient which is 10 to the third, which is a decently decently small value to be our zero point. Um, so now what we can do is figure out what the, uh, we have some criteria for solar energy converter candidates. Um, the band gaps obviously have to be within the range of solar photon energies, so anywhere from about 0.9 to 1.7 electron volts. And the absorption onset should be close to, or just a little bit higher than the band gap, so that we can ensure that electricity is generated once the photons are absorbed. Um, so this paper here, and this figure was pulled from a paper which dealt with um, finding the, uh, the absorption onsets uh, and the band gaps and compared them for copper nitride compounds. And uh, specifically this highlighted region here is the one that I just described with these two bullets. Um, and that's where we want uh, the ideal um, solar energy converter candidates to be. Uh, so. Moving forward, uh, all I have right now are just the uh, structural parameters, but the next steps we want to look at are the physical properties. So we want to look at the elastic constants and see the, um, and figure out the structural stability. Um, and after that, we can calculate the electronic properties, so the band structures, density states, and finding that band gap. And then last, uh, we want to find the optical properties, so the dielectric function and the, uh, finding that absorption onset and comparing the two, uh, comparing the absorption onset and band gap. And last but not least, we want to analyze the results and, uh, and try to figure out uh, the interesting parts of our data that we collect. So, let's see what this is. Um, so, uh, what are you dealing with right now? What's the biggest point you're dealing with? The biggest cell that I'm dealing with has 38 uh, atoms in it, and, and that's pretty... But that's, that's typically like kind of like an upper bound for reasonable calculations, and to give them a like, reasonable time. So, let's see. What is the um, hysteresis in the transition between and I mean, in the one graph you showed, the temperature range is very small. But does it literally follow the same path when it's cooling as when it's heating? Does it always come back to the same structure? Yeah, I believe so. It always goes from, let's say, like monoclinic to orthorhombic. It won't. And it doesn't, it doesn't introduce new grain boundaries and whatever as a result of doing that? Um, I'm not sure about that. Uh, 
I just know the structure changes it. It always goes from one known to another known. And we know that every time that I do that. What, what does it look like in the intermediate phase? Is it just... <laughs> uh, I'm not sure how, like, you know, instantaneous it really transitions. Uh, so I don't know if I can answer exactly how it looks in between. Uh, so. So, so, um, so silicon is like a prototype two photovoltaic material, and then we got like band gap is around one meter or something. If you get it, one point one or something. So, do you know what the absorption edge there by your definition is? Um, I don't know what off the top of my head, but I could look it up and get back to you. Yeah, I, I, sure. I, I would more make it specific. Yeah. Presumably, it's close to the gap, right? Yeah. Be nice and see. So I have a question for you. PFT visuals of vanadium oxide. Can you show me the, the table of the lattice constant? Yeah. So what first, what functional you know, PFT functional did you use? What's that? What, what type of functional did you use? GGA or LDA? Oh, uh, these were PBE actually. Yeah. PBE, yeah, GGA, GGA, yeah. GGA. But uh, then one of the constants, I think I thought that uh, V2, O3, O5, you know, the B, if you take a look at the column B, mm. the 4.66 and the other one is 4.3. So there's a huge difference compared yeah, so to other numbers. So I, I thought that maybe you used the LDA for that one, uh, compared to the, other numbers. Yeah, sometimes there's inconsistencies. Uh, it seems like with the GGA or PB, uh, it tends to slightly overestimate, whereas with the LDA, it seems it slightly underestimates. Uh, so that seems to be the trend as far as we can see. But the compared to other numbers, I think that one is quite low. So that's why I thought that. Yeah, well, like I said, it's not a perfect estimation, but it should be good enough to give us the uh, good results as far as the properties go. Then how many the balance electron for for oxa and the options do you use? So uh, there's a specific number, the potential should potential. Uh, Potential in the in the package, right? So depending on the types, you may have eight you know, uh, balance electrons. In the data, so if you take a manual, okay. so do you know the answer for the I mean the balance electrons for all that? Because that's also a really touched up your top input. You shouldn't should use any different templates, so it should be six. Yeah. Yeah, so we didn't specify it, so it should be the default. Okay. So one question for each of you. First of all, on the nitrides, um, when you were looking at the literature available for the one that had been synthesized, films or otherwise, did you get any information on what their stability is in uh, air and moisture? Um, I didn't see anything on that specifically. Um, I'd have to go back and look just just to see if I missed anything on that. I didn't see anything about what you said specifically though, so I could get back to you on that. None of the vanadium oxides. Uh, I was actually, one just clarification. So, are you looking at different allotropes or different phases? Because my understanding is for it to be an allotrope. The stoichiometry is always the same. All that's changing is the structure. Uh, so, like the six different allotropes, I mean the different basically oxygen to vanadium ratios, and then for each of those, they each have the uh, two phases uh, that exhibit the different electronic and optical properties. Uh, so that's how it comes out to the you know twelve phases in total. But it's yeah, the six allotropes, two phases each. Yeah, just a quickie. So you tried several pseudo potentials, or you just kind of picked one and ran with it based on the literature. And uh, and how did you choose a uh, convergence criteria? Is it kind of a standard thing? Like you know the program's done. You know, after. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, for the vanadium oxides, I did try uh, the different pseudo potentials, and for these, it seemed that the PBA was more consistent uh, as far as these materials go. Uh, and then the convergence. I mean, I mean it's uh, 
there's a, there's like a, a standard yeah. sort of thing that we use. Yeah. So. All right. Always well, thank.